This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. With the recent 20-year anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States, there's been lots of media coverage on that. We're going to cover a case that kind of centers around it, but it's one specific case. And as Jen alluded to, this week's case will take us to New York, New York, the Big Apple, also known as New York City. It is obviously the most populous city in the U.S. and most densely populated city with 9 million residents covering 300 square miles. It is comprised of five boroughs, which are all a separate county. Think county. The boroughs are Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island. The World Trade Center towers and the location of this case center around Manhattan, and it's the smallest of the boroughs, but the most densely populated. The median property price for Manhattan is $1,600 per square foot, making it the most expensive square foot of property in the world. And Manhattan is bound by three rivers, the Hudson River, East River, and Harlem River. It's also home to many tourist attractions like Times Square, Central Park. It is basically, if you ever see a postcard in New York, it is essentially Manhattan. Also, the location of One World Trade Center. It's the main building of the rebuilt World Trade Center complex and is the tallest building in the United States at 1,776 feet. And that wasn't by accident. Its height is the same numeric as the year the U.S. Declaration of Independence was signed, and it also has a total of 94 stories. And the thing about One World Trade Center is it shows the world that you can hit us and you can hurt us, but we rebuild bigger and better than before. This case is going to center around Sneha Phillips a 31-year-old medical intern who lived at 225 Rector Place, about two blocks from the location of the Twin Towers. Sneha was married to a man named Ron Lieberman. They met one another in 1995 when they were both students at Chicago Medical School. Sneha was native to India, but she had grown up in Albany, New York. Ron was from Louisiana and was Jewish by faith. So they had very different backgrounds, but she was an artist and he played guitar and that's kind of how they became attracted to each other through their love of, of those arts. They both graduated in 1999 and took internships in New York. Ron was at Jacoby Medical Center and Sneha was at Cabrini Medical Center. They both enjoyed jazz clubs and would make a special effort to have these time, this time at jazz clubs fit into their busy schedules. In May of 2000, Ron and Sneha married in a Jewish-Indian combined marriage ceremony. We need to start looking at this case on Monday, September 10th of 2001. Sneha was home alone in the one-bedroom apartment that afternoon, and her cousin Anu was going to come over in a few days for dinner, so she wanted to get the apartment tidied up. At about 2 p.m., she got on Instant Messenger and was chatting with her mom, and they did this for about two hours. We know that day Sneha was wearing a brown short sleeve dress, sandals, and her hair was in a ponytail. Just after 6 p.m., she had already left the apartment, and she used Ron's American Express credit card, bought some lingerie, dress, pantyhose, and bed linens at a Century 21 department store, which was also in Manhattan, not far from their apartment. She then went next door to the shoe department where she bought three pairs of shoes. Ron got home late that evening. It was around midnight because he had been working all day, and Sneha was not at home. He says that she would sometimes stay out all night, but she was supposed to call when she was not going to be home and let him know so he didn't worry. But she hadn't called. She hadn't left a message. Now, Sneha did not have a cell phone, but Ron did. So she could call his cell phone or she could leave a message on the apartment cell phone. 
But Ron said that also really didn't worry him because she had also stayed out all night and didn't call him like he had requested she do. But she usually returned home the next morning between 7 and 9 a.m. So Ron gets home, like we said, about midnight. He goes to bed. He sets his alarm because he has to leave for work by 6.30 a.m. the next morning. His alarm goes off. He gets up. Sneha's not there. But again, he wasn't overly concerned because it was usually between 7 and 9 when she got home. He went on to work the morning of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, and went to a meeting. And the meeting began at 8 o'clock. The meeting ended right after the plane struck the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. Ron tried to reach Sneha because, like we said, it was only two blocks. Their apartment was two blocks from the World Trade Center. He didn't get an answer at the home. He got the answer machine. And she never returned his call. So he calls her family members. They had not heard from her that day. Now, Ron knew Sneha had no reason that she was going to be at the World Trade Center. But with the close proximity of their apartment, he was worried because he knew it was chaotic and it was just a, a madhouse of a scene. About 3 p.m., Ron decided he was going to get a ride with one of the ambulances leaving the hospital so he could get downtown faster to Manhattan. However, that ambulance ride, because of all the chaos, took six hours. So 9 o'clock, he is in Manhattan near Ground Zero. The area was taped off and they only allowed essential personnel into the area but Ron, he was a doctor, so he was wearing his scrubs, and he was able to get into the area. He goes directly to their 23-story apartment building, but there was no electricity, and again, things are still chaotic, and the front doors wouldn't open, and he tried to get in, but he couldn't. So after a while, he decided he would go to his friend's house and stay the night. The next morning, he gets back up, and he's able to get into the apartment. Sneha was not there. He said there was ash and soot inside his apartment from the World Trade Center because there was an open window in the apartment. So it's covering the inside. And he saw footprints, but they were only from their kittens. There were no human shoe or footprints. Sneha's glasses, her driver's license, and her credit card were still in the home. Ron decided to report Sneha as one of over 9,000 people missing that day. With such a large list, I mean, the police, can you imagine be trying to narrow down 9,000 people? Oh, yeah. In the midst of a terrorist attack in the immediate aftermath, I mean, incredible. With two skyscrapers collapsed in the middle of the city. The police do just this. They start to narrow it down. Some people were located in other locations. Some people had been reported more than one time, but it gets narrowed down slowly. Well, Ron knows that the police are overwhelmed, so he goes to this 911 help center and he gives them flyers with Sneha's picture. And he's trying to get her picture out there. Has anybody seen this woman? Like we said, she was not supposed to be at the World Trade Center, but it was such a close proximity to their apartment, he didn't know what else could have happened. He tried to get the media to run her story, but they weren't interested in her particular story, especially since she wasn't even known to be at the World Trade Center. So Ron tells Sneha's brother, John, and John formulates his own plan to come talk to the media and tell them about his sister. What he says is on 9-11, he was on the phone with Sneha when the attacks began. He told her to get out of there, but she said she couldn't leave because there were people that were hurt. And then she said, I have to help this person. And that was the last thing he heard before the phone went dead. So this is going to get her story out into the media and they run her picture. Have you seen this woman? She was last known to be at the World Trade Center helping people. And, you know, it's this heroic story of a brave doctor who goes to help in the midst of a terrorist attack. But this still produced 
no leads, and no one remembered seeing Sneha during the chaos. So John realizes that his plan might not have been the best plan because he concocted this false story just to get her picture out there, but it could make police look at just that particular location when they knew the last time she was seen was on the 10th. So John decides to tell the truth that he was not really on the phone with his sister. In fact, John hadn't talked to his sister in two weeks. And like we said, there were over 9,000 initially reported missing in each one has to be investigated. So with this enormous task, Ron thinks, I'm going to hire a private investigator. I'm more likely to get, get more work done and have a better investigation, which he was probably right in that. He also gets his American Express records, and that's how they knew that Sneha had made those purchases at Century 21 on September 10th. Now, that particular Century 21 was closed down because of the tax, just like a lot of other businesses were. So he brought flyers to other Century 21 stores. And he was making the assumption that the employees from the Manhattan store had probably been transferred to other locations. And he was right. A clerk from the Manhattan store had been transferred to Brooklyn. And she recognized Sneha. She said Sneha was a regular customer. The clerk said that Sneha came in on the 10th with a female friend, and this friend was possibly Indian. She was petite and in her early 30s. Now, the clerk worked in the shoe department, and the store had no footage from the shoe department, but other parts of the store had footage. Ron took it upon himself to look through the footage, and after three weeks, he saw Sneha in the coat department, and it showed Sneha alone. Now, it took him three weeks because the times were off on the video footage, which we have told you if you've listened to any other episodes of True Crime Out Loud, video footage is not usually as straightforward as looking at video footage and it taking five to ten minutes. Now, in all of the footage that Ron sees, the female friend was not seen. He did see Sneha carrying several large bags, and that would have been the bed linens and the lingerie and dress and several things that she bought. So while Ron is looking into the case on his own, NYPD detectives rule Ron out as a suspect, and they classify Sneha as a World Trade Center victim. And as Jen mentioned, Ron hired a private investigator because he was obviously desperate to know what had happened to her. And authorities had not even finished unearthing remains at Ground Zero. They had so much going on that there just really wasn't a whole lot that they could pour directly into her case. The private investigator he hired was a former FBI agent named Ken Gallant. Ken went to the places that Sneha frequented, re-talked to those Century 21 employees, Sneha's friends, families, co-workers, took her photo around to see if anybody had even seen anything during the aftermath. Now, there was a call from the home phone of Sneha and Ron's at their apartment to Ron's cell phone at 4 a.m. on the 11th. Ron said he doesn't remember making the call, but he could have been kind of in that hazy sleep checking his messages on his cell phone. Now, Gallant's big find is a video from Sneha and Ron's apartment building. And this video shows a woman who looks like Sneha wearing similar clothes. And she was in the lobby of the apartment building just before the first plane hit the World Trade Center. However, the sun is shining directly in the lobby and the images are kind of sun washed. And Ron couldn't, when, he, when Ron saw the photographs and the video, he was unable to 100% identify that as Sneha. It looked like her. Her hair was similar. Her mannerisms were similar. She was dressed similar to what Sneha had been wearing, but they were unsure for a hundred percent. The woman entered the lobby and stood near the elevator, waited a minute or two, turned around and exited the building. So they're left with this puzzle. I mean, if this is her, what does this mean? Because if it was her, then she was last seen on September 11th walking out of that building two blocks from the World Trade Center at about the exact 
time that the terrorist attack began. And that changes their timeline a lot because previous to that, the last known contact with Sneha was on September 10th. Her family said that the only logical explanation for this was that Sneha would have rushed to the World Trade Center to help save lives. And they believed that the person in the video was her. They theorized that she may have bumped into some friends while shopping and went out for dinner or drinks and just spent the night at the friend's home since Ron was working late. And then they think that she came home the next morning. That's when you see her in the lobby on the camera and then died in the World Trade Center attack, which, you know, that fits with the circumstances around that day. However, the woman in the video could not be confirmed as Sneha and she didn't have those large shopping bags that Jen mentioned. And we know that Sneha had made several purchases that would have required her to carry, you know, bags with three pairs of shoes or whatever. Those bags were also not located in the apartment. So she spent money on the credit card and those items were not ever located. One year later, her family has a ceremony where they bury an urn containing ashes from Ground Zero because they have not recovered Sneha's remains. In 2003, Ron filed a claim with the Victims' Compensation Fund, and this is a fund that was set up to assist financially victims of the 9-11 attack or their survivors. Well, the police decide that they're going to do a further investigation on their own, and they found some other things. They found out that Sneha had some things she might be keeping from her family and even her husband. Everything wasn't as clear as maybe Sneha ran into the building to help people. In the spring of 2001, Sneha was at Cabrini Medical Center, and she was told by the director that her contract would not be renewed. So she's an intern there, and she's being fired. This non-renewal of her contract was allegedly due to tardiness and alcohol-related issues. Now, Sneha's family comes back and say, no, 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 it was due to racial and sexual bias because she was a whistleblower. What was she a whistleblower about? This is where it kind of gets in a little bit deeper and a little confusing, but Sneha is let go shortly after that she filed a police report about an incident at a bar with a co-worker from Cabrini. She said she was having an evening out with some friends from work, and this fellow intern grabbed her inappropriately. This case was investigated, and it ended up with Sneha being arrested. She was arrested for filing a false complaint. The district attorney told Sneha, we'll drop the charges against you if you just be honest and recant your statement against the co-worker. Sneha refused to do so, so she was arrested. We started this case on the afternoon of September 10th. Well, the morning of September 10th, Sneha was in court on this charge for filing a false complaint, and Ron went with her. According to police reports and court documents and everything that is public about this case, Sneha and Ron got into an argument after court about her alleged drug abuse and affairs. And Sneha left out of the court by herself without Ron. Now, Ron denied this. After Sneha left Cabrini Medical Center, she was working at St. Vincent's. She had been doing that since the spring. And she had already been suspended for failing to meet her required substance abuse counselor. And it was looking like her job was not going so great there either. They also discovered that Sneha staying out late at night and all night wasn't always with friends. She would meet people in bars and go home with complete strangers. Now, these bars that Sneha frequented were lesbian bars. Now, Ron says that Sneha liked to go there, especially after the incident of being groped by a co-worker and wanted to be away from men, but other people said that might not exactly be the case. She was going home with some of these women. 
Ron says it was strictly platonic. He said Sneha told him about the nights they would stay up talking till they fell asleep. In one incident, she came home covered in paint because they had been painting all night. He said that he and Sneha didn't live a conservative lifestyle, but it didn't mean that anything abnormal was going on, according to a statement he made to New York Magazine. He also said he'd been going to bars all his life and it wasn't a dangerous thing to do. Other people might disagree with that. According to a police report, Sneha's brother, and he tells this to the investigating detective, John caught Sneha and his girlfriend engaged in sexual relations. Now, John, the brother, denies and said he didn't tell this to the police and they made it up and it was an absolute lie. He didn't, he didn't catch his sister and his girlfriend. So in January of 2004, Sneha, along with two other names, were removed from the list of 9-11 victims. They did this because they couldn't be exactly sure when and where Sneha had died. And as far as they knew, she was last seen on September 10th. According to New York state law, a person, once they're missing, you have to wait three years for them to be declared legally dead. And it is three years after the date they were seen. So her date of death was declared as September 10th, 2004. Ron and Sneha's family fought this. I mean, they wanted her name added back to the list of 9-11 victims. Now, I've seen different comments about Ron was doing this to get money from the victim's compensation fund, but that's not true. By this point, when he's doing all this fighting and paying money to attorneys to have her name added back, the compensation fund had run out and he was not entitled to any money at that point. An appeals court finally reversed the decision, saying there was no proof she took a route that morning near or into the Trade Center, but evidence showed that it was highly probable she died on September 11th at the site of the World Trade Center. So this was a victory for the family. That's what they wanted. They wanted her listed as a victim. In 2008, Sneha's name was added back to the list of official victims, and she became the 2,751st victim of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I told you earlier about a comment Ron made to New York Magazine with this interviewer, Mark Foss, wanted to see the private investigation file for himself because he, had, he did a lot of investigative work on this. Ron refused to let the journalists see this private investigation file. So we have Sneha added back to the official list of victims of the 9-11 terror attack, and the case takes another interesting turn. And that turn is going to focus on a website known as Post Secret. And it's basically a blog. It's run by a guy named Frank Warren, and he started this in 2004. It offers people the opportunity to tell their deepest, darkest secrets via postcard and to do it anonymously. Think, uh, I don't know, confession without the religion. The rules are that what they say must be true and it cannot have ever been revealed to anyone before. They present the new postcards every Sunday with all kinds of messages. So, for example, one of the postcards that he received was in the form of a flattened Starbucks coffee cup, and it had a message on it that said, I give decaf to customers who are rude to me. So that's kind of funny. You get a chuckle out of that. Another one said, Dear birth mother, I have great parents. I am in love. But some of them were a lot darker in nature. Some revolve around suicidal thoughts, mental health issues, marriages, divorces, etc. But the most famous post-secret postcard is a postcard that looks like two tall buildings on fire. And it has the message on it, everyone who knew me before 9-11 believes I'm dead. Now, this could be someone just getting attention, or people say that it could have been Sneha posting this postcard that is now showing up on this site. We couldn't locate the date the card was published, but we do know it had to be 2004 or later because that's when he formed the site and started the postcard exchange thing. 
I have put in our sources on our website, if you go look under sources for a Sneha Phillip case, you'll see a TED Talk, and it is with Frank Warren, and it talks about how he started this. But I went to look at Post Secret because I was looking for that postcard and trying to find when it was originally published, and it has been published several times since. And I spent three hours reading people's secrets. And I will tell you, go check it out because it it's amazing some of the things that people say and you'll cry and laugh like in, within the same 30 second time span. So that that is basically the end of the Sneha Phillip case. Oh, I love these that don't have a conclusion. I know. I know you do. But officially, she's listed as a victim of the attack on the World Trade Center, September 11th. And her name is etched on the memorial there. And there are memorials to her in, in different locations. But just because that's what's official, does that mean that's exactly what happened? So the theories are she died in the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Another theory, she committed suicide either on the 10th or the 11th. Next theory, she was murdered or some kind of foul play happened on September 10th or before the September 11th attacks. The last theory is she left to start a new life. So I really want to, to kind of get into these just a little bit. B, go ahead and give me your opinion what you think. Well, you know how I am, and most of our listeners will know also. I'm a big believer in Occam's razor. The thing that is most likely to be is probably what it really is. In fact, I think that Sneha probably died in the World Trade Center collapse. And, and, I, and I think that for a couple of reasons, for those of us who remember that day, it wasn't like the plane struck the tower and it immediately fell. I mean, we've all seen and have burned into our mind those images of uh, New Yorkers running from the buildings away with policemen and firemen, you know, trying to get away as the building is coming down. It wasn't anticipated that the building would collapse, at least not by the average bystander. So with her medical training and everything, it's entirely possible that she did make her way to the World Trade Center in an attempt to help and then perished in the collapse. I think that's the most likely scenario. But, I mean, there's some, there's some hitches in that. I, I don't know. Well, my hitch with that theory is, and you said it yourself, you see people running away. Police and fire are evacuating a building that has had a plane crash into it that's on fire. Is a medical doctor going to run into that building that they're getting people out of? Well, sure. The, absolutely. Because there were all kinds of people that day who took all kinds of actions. So while you see these videos of, and, and I'm not saying anything disparaging about people fleeing the area, especially as the tower is collapsing, you know, we remember those those shots because the, remember the TV crew and everything they had time to get there and set up. I mean, we have pictures, video, live feeds of the towers falling with people moving away from them, and you had people, different people from all walks of life who took all kinds of different steps that day. You have Rick Rascorlo, which is a story in and of itself. I mean, he went back in several times. He was just a citizen, and he ended up perishing. I'm sure he was instructed by policemen or firemen at some point to leave the area, but he didn't, and as a result, he saved a bunch of lives. You had police and fire who may have been on the outside of the building and, and, and left as the building started coming down. They, they saw that the tower was coming down. Meanwhile... We also have stories of, of officers and firemen who repeatedly went into the building even as it was falling down. So I don't think you can say, while the majority of the people were trying to move away from the building, somebody who has medical training and is that kind of person who maybe personally has decided that they would lay their life down for someone else, I mean, that person... You know as well as I do, that person may ignore orders from a policeman that's leaving the area or 
you, you know, I mean, that's a personal commitment that people make. The fact that most people are leaving doesn't make me think that she's going to leave necessarily. I don't know. I just, I don't have an exact theory myself. I, I don't know. I think it's probably most likely that she somehow died in the attacks, whether she was close by when the building collapsed, she was in the building. I think that is most likely, but you know, I also like to think kind of a uh, romantic thoughts that she's sitting on a beach somewhere drinking a pina colada out of a coconut cup and and in her bikini just living her life up i don't think that's possible and the reason is i mean we didn't know i mean you and i have discussed this we were both already police officers by the time this happened and we didn't know immediately what was going on so she would have had to hey something's going on i'm gonna run away I, I don't think that's that's possible. She didn't have time to develop in her mind a plan to run away. Uh, to use the terrorist attack as, as cover? An ex yeah. No, I, I, I don't think so. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. I don't think I don't think that's that's possible. But it is a theory. Now, we didn't discuss those packages were never found. We know she spent the night with strangers. Nobody ever came forward to say, oh, yeah, she left her bags at my house or she spent the night at my house. And there could be reasons for that. First of all, if Sneha was engaged, was engaging in bisexual relationships with with men and women, and this could have been a woman that didn't want people to know, of course, she may not come forward. Second of all, that person could have worked at the World Trade Center. I mean, you're right there at it and they could have died. So. Never there was reported. no one to tell. Yeah. I mean, that could be. I mean there, there's several different theories as to why that didn't happen. I just have issues with the day of the 11th. And Ron said she was home between 7 and 9 usually. And we know the attacks happened right before 9. This woman is seen in the lobby. But even Ron couldn't say if it was Sneha. And the reason I have issue with that is... The family is protecting Sneha's image. I mean, that is obvious. And you don't, you can't blame them at all. They want people to think that she, she did rush into the buildings no matter what happened. And, and most likely that, that is what happened. But that video has not been made public. And that's not a video just the police have. That's a video that her family has seen and that they have. And I think that they're holding on to that because if other people see it, then they're going to say, oh, that's definitely not Sneha. And she wasn't there in that apartment building. Well, I don't think. And, and again, I don't know what the police investigation, what their role would be in getting her back onto the list of 9-11 victims. But I think if a detective or members of the NYPD look at that video and it is blatantly obvious that it's not her, then then that then that would have gotten out. The police would release that, I believe. Even if they don't release the physical video, if that if everything is hinging on that that video, if that's the proof that she was alive on the eleventh, and they can irrefutably disprove that, then I think they would have said that. I really do. And they probably would have they probably would have discouraged or taken whatever steps they could to prevent her from from being put back on the the 911 victims list. I I see what you're saying about them trying to protect her image and it's obvious that she was there were areas of her life that were not public to everybody. But I, I don't think I think I, I think you raised a good point. It could be that the other half um, of the story perished in the 9-11 attacks as well. And so they couldn't say, oh, well, that that Sneha girl left her her bag of new shoes at my house. It, it's just hard to say. Well, and it's it's also she was I mean, Ron says, oh, it's not dangerous going out to clubs. OK, maybe not so. But when you're going home with complete strangers. That is a very dangerous lifestyle. That's what leads me to say that I'm not 100% on the side of her dying in the attacks. Well, sure. And, and like I said, I think that the most likely scenario is just that, the most likely one. I, there's, room for, there's room for doubt, obviously, without rock-solid proof. I find it telling that Ron, that Ron said that her mannerisms were the same. 
she appears to be dressed in the cloak. This is the woman in the video now. She appears to be dressed in the same or similar clothing that she was last known to be wearing. So you. But he still couldn't say. Well, well, yeah, but if it was her or not. But here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing in my mind. So we have video of her on the tenth that we know is her in the store, and she's dressed a certain way. Okay, then we have video of her on the eleventh at the time that he expects her to be going back into the building, right? It fits the timeline between seven and nine. Okay. So it fits when she's supposed to be coming home if she chooses to stay out all night. All right. And she does. She comes home and it looks like her. It, the person in the video is dressed like her. The mannerisms are the same. So, but, but according to the family, it looks like her. We also know, according to the family, they have said, oh, the police are lying. I didn't say this or this is not true. The police have, I mean, they have no stake in this to lie and say, oh, the brother told me he called him, caught his sister with his girlfriend. I mean, what what role would the police have to make that up? No, I don't. And so, well, hold on. What I'm getting at is, according to the family, that video looks like her. I don't I don't trust what they're saying, but a hundred percent because they are trying to protect her image and I can't blame them at all for doing that. And in the end, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if it makes the family feel better about this for her to be listed as one of the victims on 9-11, so be it. Put her name on there and keep it on there. And her name is on there. But I'm saying if that makes the family feel better about this and that gives them some closure and some resolve, it really doesn't doesn't matter to the rest of us. But I have issues with with some of the things that they have said and then the fact that they're not going to show the private investigation file and and the video. I, I just I have issues with that in fully committing to what they're saying and fully believing what they're saying. Well, I, I kind of understand that. But in the, in the same turn, it's just like you said, she ha obviously had areas of her life that are private. And if that private investigators file contains disparaging things about it and about her and it very well might or things that the public may consider disparaging or her family it sounds like ron's trying to protect her family well, and how they feel and and if and if those things aren't relevant to the case directly um because because let's face it a lot of this isn't you know the bars that she frequented were uh were, you know, known to be frequented by lesbians. Well, I don't know that that really makes any difference. Well, it does. Wait a second. You, you're jumping on me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I don't, I, don't know that that, I don't know that that makes any difference. Now, that's not an area of her life that her family knew about. Sounds like Ron was pretty in tune with what was going on. I don't think that caught him by surprise. And he said... We don't necessarily have a, a traditional relationship, but we're not, you know, so, so, hey, if you told me that just on the average day, hey, you know, if for some reason I don't show up, I'll probably be home at between seven and nine. And that happens, that would be unusual in a typical relationship. And so what I'm saying is, is that I can see them holding that back and I don't think it's relevant to uh, to what happened to her. Even if you buy into the theory that, you know, she was killed on the 10th or whatever. Well, that could happen in a, in a bar that's frequented by straight people or a bar that's frequented by gay people. I mean, it really doesn't matter. They probably just don't want her personal life drug out to be speculated on by a bunch of people. That That's, that's my take. I think the reason that that was brought up is to say, oh, well, she didn't necessarily have the best marriage if she's out at bars and making having relationships with other women or possibly other men and going home with them and staying all night. I think I think that was the whole point of, of that being brought into the case. And like you said, Ron might have known and he might have been okay with it. But I think that was where the whole thing came in. They had the argument that day and he was arguing with her at the court about her drug use and her affairs. And then he comes back later to defend her, and rightly so. I would hope you would defend me in any any case like this, and 
and want me to look the best that I look because that's that's human nature. We want our deceased loved ones to have the best image possible. And I don't know either of these people, obviously, but in my mind, the argument outside the courthouse is like, hey, look, I love you. You're flushing your life down the drain. You're having problems at these jobs. You have been arrested for filing a false police report. What are you doing? In my mind, it's way more of a get your life back on track than uh, I just can't put up with your affairs anymore because men, women, whoever, you start telling me that you're, I'll just get home when I get home, usually between seven and nine, and I'm not going with that. All right. And I, and I think, so I think that Ron probably, I I think that Ron probably knew and was, and was okay with at least acceptance of that behavior to some extent. And therefore he again, doesn't want to drag her personal life out. And again, I don't think it's relevant. Once you clear Ron, the status of her marriage has no bearing in the case. Well, and you have a point there. You don't want hear me say that very often. Although it happens more than you'd think. But you do have a point there. I didn't think, I mean, it didn't occur to me that that's why he would not want them looking into that private investigation file. But I also understand why all this came up, all of it combined, and the fact that, say, the fight was about get your crap together and you're you're a doctor and you're going to not be able to practice because of the things you're doing and get your stuff together, all happening the same day that she was last seen. I think that's all of that kind of comes into play. You take all these factors together and it's not as simple as, oh, she was at the World Trade Center. Well, it's certainly not that simple, like I said, because there's no conclusive proof. But I, I still don't think that that's a big deal. That argument that argument happened on the 10th because that's when the court day was. That's when the chickens came home to roost, so to speak. It's time to answer for the things we've done wrong. We're, we're, and, and that's kind of gut check time. That's when we're going to do the, the, if we're Ron, that's when we're going to do the intervention. Here we are in court because you've been charged with making up an, an allegation. You got problems at work. You got problems at home. I love you. You're flushing your life down the toilet. I kind of see it as way more of that. And and like I said, in my opinion, None of that really matters. That I'm not all that swayed one way or the other about Ron and her arguing outside of, of the courtroom. That's going to happen. I would expect that if I was arrested, you probably wouldn't be real thrilled about it standing outside of the courtroom with me. So I'm not real concerned about that. I think he doesn't want to drag her name through the mud. I also don't think it has a whole lot of relevance to the case. And the same can be the the video definitely has relevance for the case but i think the further this technology you know and our world our information world goes on and let's face it we're discussing the case in a true crime podcast some people probably i probably shouldn't say this i'm i'm really talking against our bread and butter but some people don't that's want that's not our bread and butter we don't get paid to do that 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 is true there is not much butter on the bread but some people may not want their personal life picked apart by internet sleuths. And you know what? I'm a, I'm about that. I'm about that. If the family believes that that's her in the video and Ron is certain but not sure, I don't care to see the video. I don't need to. Because it shouldn't be up to me as someone who's never met this woman to look at a picture of her on my computer screen versus a grainy crappy sun bleached video and go oh, i think that's her i don't think it's her because at the end of the day it doesn't matter whether b thinks it's her or not i agree like i said in the end if her family has closure with her being added to the list of victims so be it if something happened to her the day before i don't know that we'll ever know because of the chaos that ensued afterwards you know on, on the 11th and Like I said, I'm one of those who likes to think romantic thoughts that she's sitting on a beach somewhere drinking her pina colada. But I know that's not practical. But if that makes me feel better about things, I guess that's what I need to think. Yeah. then And, and, you know, we've talked about that before in these other missing, you know, missing persons cases and all that. Very, very rare that people disappear and start a new life. And there's there is no, it never gets back. <laughs> Look, that doesn't really work with 100% efficiency when the federal government sets you up with a new life in the witness protection program. 
people are still found out all the time in the witness protection program and the federal government has issued them new IDs, new social security number, new job, new area of the country, new everything. And people go, Oh, you know, that's still Sammy, the bull Gravano. I mean, people get found out for one run one way or another. And like I said, that's with the assistance of the federal government, this 31 year old medical resident didn't see the plane hit the world trade center and go up. Oh, it's my perfect opportunity to ditch my life and go drink margaritas on the beach. Just didn't happen. I, I would agree with that statement, but again, I'm still open. I think it's most likely she did die in the attacks, but I think they're still open or there's still room for debate on what actually happened to Sneha. Well, sure. I, I would, I would agree with that. I think the, I think the, uh, Post secret thing is weird. On a side note, that's weird. And I will tell you, I give that card absolutely zilcho credibility. That could end that could have been any person anywhere about any that may not even be a person familiar with the Sneha case. That might just be somebody who sent that in. Oh well, yeah, I think so. I don't think it was Sneha. I think she was smart enough if she got to start over and nobody had found her out, why is she gonna send a postcard to post secret? But it is an interesting little tidbit that goes along with this case. And I have the picture. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see the picture of the postcard or you can go to our website and see it. So at the end of the day, she probably did perish along with all those other people in the World Trade Center. And that's that's the big takeaway from this thing. I will say on kind of a personal editorial note, um, it's incredible to me that it's been 20 years uh, since this happened. I mean, I, I guess this is the the Kennedy assassination of our generation. Um, I remember exactly what I was doing, exactly where I was. I remember those circumstances so vividly, and I just I can't uh, I can't say enough how brave those people were everyone involved and I long for that feeling of togetherness that the country had in the immediate aftermath of that because I don't I don't feel like we're there right now yeah and we've talked a lot about that lately because you like I said you and I were both already in law enforcement and just the the feel of our departments our countries our communities I've read so many incredible stories about so many heroes that we didn't always hear about during this case. And like you said, 20 years and I can still, I was in bed because I was working night shift. I still remember the quilt that I had on my bed. I mean, it's that ingrained into my memory. Do an internet search for the fighter pilots of 9-11 and hear their stories. It, it is amazing the sacrifice these people were willing to take. Read about the Marriott Hotel and how the employees there were never seen again after helping people get out and try to get get away from the World Trade Center. I mean, it's it's amazing that that the human being that we see so many horrible things out of can turn around and do so many wonderful things. Well, and it's just a very blatant example of how. When Americans are put to the test, we come together and we perform. And we have to believe in that good of humanity. It's like you said, uh, we see so much negative in the world and we do need to stop and, and take time to focus on people who performed their absolute very best when the country was at its very worst. We hope you enjoyed this week's case. And as always... We'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com. 